Welcome to Chapter 8.1. Section 8.1 is all about organizing and picturing data. Specifically in this chapter, we will be analyzing data sets. What is a data set, you ask? Well, in general, a data set will be any collection of qualitative or quantitative variables. But in this chapter, we'll be focusing on quantitative data, or data based on numbers. This means we'll look at values like test scores, company profits, sports statistics, or anything else we can assign a number to. Once we get to chapter 9, we'll talk about methods of gathering data. For now though, we'll be given a data set and we will want to answer the question, what does the data tell us? In answering this question, we will do an exploratory data analysis, which means we will be looking at the big picture to search for any patterns in the data that may emerge. There are many ways to do an exploratory data analysis, but if we want to get a good overview, it's worth remembering the old adage that a picture is worth a thousand words. With this in mind, we'll be looking at various ways to represent data as a picture, and we'll examine those pictures for clusters, where there's lots of data, gaps, where there is no data, and outliers, single points far away from the rest of the data. When it comes to pictorial representations of the data, the main options we will use are dot plots, stem and leaf plots, histograms, bar graphs, line graphs, and pie charts. The first type of graph we will look at are dot plots. In a dot plot, each data point is represented by a dot. If two or more data points are at the same value, we stack them on top of one another, and the number of data points at the same value is the frequency. So let's take a look at an example of a dot plot. You can see here we have a set of test scores for an Econ 101 course. So if we graph them as a dot plot and stack the repeated scores on top of one another, our dot plot will look something like this. Looking at this graph, we can see that most of our data is clustered between about the 60 and 95 or 96 area. You can also see that we've got a large gap in the data in the 40s. Now we also have two outliers that are far away from the rest of the data. Doing this gives us a reasonable picture of how the class overall did on this particular test. In this case, we can see that most of the students did about as well as you'd expect them to do on a test, and that that score of 26 and 32 on the bottom aren't really indicative of the difficulty level of the test. Rather, they likely speak to the student's individual level of preparedness, or in this case, their lack thereof. A second way we can interpret data is by using stem and leaf plots. Stem and leaf plots have the advantage that of grouping data into categories, making it easier to identify clusters. They're also very fast and easy to make, meaning that if you want a quick snapshot of the data, they are an excellent place to start. The downside, though, of using stem and leaf plots is that they don't look very professional, so they're great for your own personal use, but not for the sort of thing you'd want to show your boss or put on a motivational poster. To see an example, let's again take a look at that Econ 101 test. Now the stem in this case will be our tens digits, going from the 20s on the bottom to the 90s on the top, and the leaves will be our one digits written in ascending order. So, for instance, we had a score of a 93, 95, 96. Our stem is the 9, our ones are 3, 5, and 6. Notice again how we can detect the clusters. In this case, it's very clear that most of the students scored around the 80s. And notice also how we can see that gap around the 40s where there were no scores. So while we don't have a graph that we'd want to show off to other people, we do get a very good picture, once again, about just where our data is and what our data is trying to tell us. Now it's your turn. Using what we just discussed, I'd like you to draw a stem and leaf plot of the number of points our Grizzlies put up in each game during the 2013 football season. Go ahead and pause the video, try it on your own, and when you're done, start the video again and we can see how you did. All set. All right, let's take a look at what the answer should be. Did you get this? If so, you're ready to move on to the next type of graph. The third type of graph we'll look at are called histograms. You can think of histograms as socially, socially acceptable stem and leaf plots. That is, they display data in much the same way as a stem and leaf plot, but they are professional looking so you can freely share them with other people. 
Since they're so closely related to stem and leaf plots, let's take a histogram by starting with the stem and leaf plot we made of the Econ 101 test. From this stem and leaf plot, then, our first step in creating histogram is to create a frequency table. So, here's our frequency table. Now, you'll notice on the left side, we now have intervals, and those intervals which are also sometimes called measurement classes or bins, tell us what data points are being counted where. The frequency then tells us how many data points are in each interval. So for instance, in the interval from 90 to 99, we had test scores of 93, 95, and 96. So our interval is 90 to 99. The frequency of that interval is 3. Now when we determine the size of the bin, you do need to be a little bit cautious and be aware of the type of data we're using. In this example, for instance, the bin length is 10 because each interval has 10 possible values. Again, if we take the 90s, we've got 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, and 99. So even though if we were to just subtract, we get 9, we can actually see by counting there are indeed 10, inter 10 possible values in that interval, so our bin length is 10. Now that we've got our frequency table, the next step is to use it to construct our histogram. To do this, we put the intervals we used along the x-axis, the frequency values on the y-axis, and draw bars of the appropriate height. And that's all there is to it. Okay, time to try another one on your own. Now be careful this time. The bin length of 20 means that this will look a little bit different than your stem and leaf plot. But go ahead and see what you can do with this question. Pause the video now and restart it when you're ready to continue. Ready to see the results? The first thing you should have done when making this histogram was to make a frequency table. Since we wanted a bin length of 20, and since football teams can score as few as zero points, your frequency table should look something like this. From here then, it's just a matter of drawing the histogram, and if yours looks anything like this, then you're on the right track. Before we go on, one thing to notice about this histogram is that the gaps in our data set are no longer noticeable. This is because the bin length we chose was so large it ended up obscuring those gaps. Choosing the right bin length for your data set is important, and this is something we'll discuss a little bit more when we get to that point in class. One final type of histogram to look at for now is known as a relative frequency histogram. These are called relative frequency histograms because it graphs the relative frequency, which is just a frequency examined as a percent of the whole and written as a decimal. So for an example of this again, we'll take a look at that Econ 101 test. Since there are 20 students in the class, each student has a relative frequency of 0 0.05. Adding a relative frequency column to our table gives us a table like this. And you can see that, for instance, our interval between 20 and 29, where we had only one student, has a relative frequency of 0 0.05, whereas our interval between 80 and 89, where we had seven students, now has a frequency of 0.35. As far as graphing this, the only thing that's going to change about our graph is our y-axis. We won't call it frequency anymore, and we won't number it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Rather, it will be relative frequency, and it will be numbered according to the percents, or the decimal values that we have. So our graph will look virtually identical to what we have before, and that's exactly how you graph a relative frequency. Now the histograms we've been examining are actually a subset of a larger group of graphs known as bar graphs. All histograms are bar graphs, but not all bar graphs are histograms. So it's important to know the limitations of histograms and what restrictions are listed when we turn into looking at general bar graphs. This slide has an example of a bar graph that is a histogram on the left hand side an example of a bar graph that is not a histogram on the right side. Take a moment to see if you can spot the big differences that makes the one on the left a histogram and the one on the right a bar graph.
Ready? Let's see if we can summarize some of these key differences. Starting with the histograms, we can see that they are for a single set of data which is broken into interval. In this case we're looking at average SAT math scores, one data type. The bins themselves are numerical in order and cannot be changed or rearranged. After all, it wouldn't make any sense to have the interval starting at 474 next to the interval starting at 771. It's just numbers in between. It wouldn't make sense to rearrange the data in that way. Now, bar graphs can be like this since all histograms are bar graphs, but in general, bar graphs may follow these rules, but they can also be used for showing multiple types of data at the same time. In this case, the areas of spending are all different types of data, Social Security and Medicare, debt interest, law enforcement and government administration, etc. The order can sometimes also be rearranged. In this example, for instance, there's no reason to have the debt interest on the far right. We could have just as easily have put it next to the Social Security and Medicare or the Community and State Development, and our graph would still have the same purpose. The fifth type of graph we'll look at are called line graphs. Line graphs connect data points together with lines, and as such are best used to demonstrate changes, most often changes over time. You can see two examples of line graphs to the right. And it's time for another status check. So looking at the line graph below, in which game during the 2013 season did the Grizzlies score the most points? Pause the video, and once you have an answer, plus press play to see if you are correct. Have an answer? If you said game four, you got this one right, and you're ready for our final type of graph. The final graph we look at in section 8.1 is the pie chart. Now pie charts are best used when displaying the percentages of different parts of a whole. Most of the time when you have a pie chart you will be able to draw it using a computer or other electronic tool. But when checking other people's pie charts to make certain that they're accurate, or when drawing one by hand, it can be useful to know how to find the central angle of each slice of the pie and determine what angle it should have. To find the central angle, simply multiply the percent as a decimal by 360, the number of degrees in a full circle, and you'll get your result. For example, if we were interested in the central angle corresponding to the percent of adults who get five or fewer hours of sleep each night, we'd simply multiply 0 0.06 for the 6% by 360 and get 21.6 or about a 22 degree angle. Ready for your final do-it-yourself problem? Pause the video now and start it again when you think you have the answer. Ready? If you multiplied 0 0.37 by 360 and got about 133 degrees, you've got the right idea. In conclusion then, in this section we've seen that dot plots can be used to show clusters, gaps, and outliers, that stem and leaf plots are quick graphs that display data grouped into categories, that histograms display data grouped into measurement classes or intervals, that bar graphs can be used to group data by categories, that line graphs are best for displaying trends and variations, mostly over time, and that pie charts can be used whenever we want to compare percentages or parts of the whole. Be certain to look at some of the practice problems from section 8.1 and look forward to seeing you in class.